Good afternoon. Uh, the first item of business is portfolio questions. I start with education and skills. Uh, can I remind members that questions four and six are grouped together? So question four gets a supplementary, question six gets a supplementary. Anyone wants to ask a supplementary thereafter comes in after questions four and six. I hope you took notes. Question one, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it is responding to reports that knowledge of changes in pupil performance is at a 70-year low. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, we simply do not agree with this assertion. We now collect and publish literacy and numeracy performance data at national, local authority, school and stage level on an annual basis. This data covers around 50,000 pupils and gives us detailed information on writing, reading, listening and talking and numeracy. We did not have anything approaching this much detail when Curriculum for Excellence was implemented. Alexander Burnett. Uh, Presiding Officer, the Independent Commission on School Reform were clear last week that our data on school performance is worse now than at any time since the 1950s. And that's because the SNP has scrapped almost every survey of pupil performance and pulled Scotland out of every international study except PISA, which incidentally showed our schools plummeting to record lows in maths and science. So if a Cabinet Secretary is so convinced that he's making improvements to Scottish education, why does he keep abolishing any impartial evidence that could back him up? Cabinet Secretary. I completely disagree with Mr Burnett's series of baseless assertions. Uh, the government has subscribed to the PISA analysis, which was reported on uh, two weeks ago. Uh, last week, uh, I came here and made a statement uh, based on the collection of data on the performance of 50,000 pupils across different levels of Curriculum for Excellence, which, when that data is published, <coughs> enables us to respond to the challenges that that data uh, uh, throws up about performance within individual schools so we can actually improve outcomes for individual children and young people within our education system. So I believe we have more data, more information and more ability to improve an, uh, in performance within Scottish education and as a consequence improve outcomes for children and young people. And as a matter of fact for uh, Mr Burnett, the data on Scottish education in the PISA analysis shows that performance in reading has improved significantly and performance in maths and science is stable, although it needs to improve and that's what we're working to achieve. Thank you. Question two, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether the review of coordinated support plans for children with additional needs will be conducted as part of or subsequent to the Morgan review of additional support needs. Cabinet Secretary. As part of the review of additional support for learning, Angela Morgan is considering the different approaches to planning that are used to meet children and young people's needs. Ms Morgan will report to Scottish Ministers Anne Cosler in early 2020. The findings from her review will then be used to inform the work that has been taken forward to enhance implementation of support, additional support for learning, including the review of the use of coordinated support plans. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The reason I asked this question is in response to a written question I lodged, the Cabinet Secretary said that the review of coordinated support plans would take place as part of the Morgan review. I wrote to the, those conducting the Morgan review who confirmed the opposite, that it would take place subsequent to their review. So I'm simply asking for a very clear clarification. Will it be part of the Morgan review or will it be subsequent to the Morgan review? Because I currently have two contradictory answers. Cabinet Secretary. I apologise if we've been unclear in uh, communicating to Mr Greer the position. What my, um, the answer I've just put on the record is designed to say is that Angela Morgan will be considering the different approaches to planning that are used to meet children and young people's needs. That may raise issues about coordinated support plans, which we will then go on to review as a consequence. So if we've uh, not expressed that clearly enough, I hope that it sets out the position as clearly as I can today. Ian Gray, followed by Beatrice Swish. Uh, thank you. Uh, as the Cabinet Secretary knows, this is really important because the coordinated support plan is the only mechanism which uh, gives uh, a child and its family uh, recourse to certain legal rights. Um, back in August, figures we uh, had discovered showed that um, even if you look at uh, those children with additional support needs who receive support not just from education but from social work as well, only 3% have coordinated support plans and therefore access to those legal rights. So. Uh, whether it's through the Morgan Review or subsequently to the Morgan Review, will the Deputy First Minister undertake to take some action to ensure that more uh, children with additional support needs get access to the legal rights which this Parliament has legislated for them? 
Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I agree entirely with the direction of Mr Gray's point that any uh, child or young person that has the necessity for a coordinated support plan should have that coordinated support plan. That was the legislative intent of Parliament and that is what should be applied. Now, as Mr Gray will know, um, the decision on whether a young person um, has a coordinated, coordinated support plan is not mine. It is the statutory responsibility of local authorities. Now, uh, that's not in any way to pass responsibility. It's to recognise that statutory fact. But I take seriously the point that Mr Gray raises, that if a child needs a coordinated support plan, they should have that. That is the intent of legislation. And what I hope comes out of the Morgan review is information which enables us to take uh, more action if it is required to address the issue that Mr Gray has raised with me today. Beatrice Fisher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the last 10 years, the number of additional support needs teachers has, be, has reduced, while the number of pupils requiring ASN support has increased markedly, with 31% recorded as having an additional support needs. One ASN teacher described to me the heavy workload, with GERFEC forms for each pupil could taking up to four, six hours to complete. How can the Scottish Government ensure that ASN teachers have time to devote to pupils while dealing with the necessary paperwork? Cabinet Secretary. The first point I'd make, Presiding Officer, is that obviously the definition of additional support needs was, has been expanded significantly in the period that Beatrice Wisher refers to, which accounts for the significant expansion in the number of young people presenting with additional support needs. And it also demonstrates the fact that we are trying to address the needs of those young people within the mainstream education system, where, of course, we have an increasing number of teachers within the system. In relation to all staff who are supporting pupils with additional support needs, we are seeing a rise in those staff. Um, the most recent data in 2018 is 17,412, which is a, an increase from 16,343 the previous year. What's important to recall here is the necessity of ensuring that the needs of individual ch children and young people are met and met properly. That's what statute says. And therefore, whether that support is provided by a mainstream teacher properly trained to deliver that support, or whether it's by um, additional specific staff uh, dealing with additional support needs, we have to make sure that the needs of children and young people are met, and that responsibility falls in statute to local authorities to ensure that is the case. Question three, Colin Smith. And officer, and my apologies that due to other parliamentary business, I need to leave um, after my question uh, to ask the Scottish Government when the root cause analysis report on the North West Community Campus in Dumfries will be published. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, the root cause analysis report has now been finalised with Dumfries and Galloway Council and other stakeholders. The Scottish Futures Trust will publish the report along with lessons learned early in the new year. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. When I asked the same question in August, the Cabinet uh, Secretary's reply then was to say that the review was complete. So I'm unsure why it's taken six months to get to where we are. But given that the company responsible for the shoddy workmanship at the North West Community Campus continue to receive millions of pounds of taxpayers' money for public sector contracts, and this review is being carried out by the Scottish Futures Trust, who are part of the model that let people down when it came to the construction of this school, how can people be reassured that this review will get to the real real cause of the problem and not simply be a whitewash. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think it would be best to see the report once it's published. That might give an insight into what the report raises, because what I would expect the report to do is to look at the circumstances that have led to the issues, the very real issues that presented themselves at the North West Community Campus. Now, I'm not going to prejudge that report. It will come out. We can, I'm happy to consider the issues that, are, uh, uh, that arise out of that. Uh, and I'm not going to speculate on what might be in its contents. It's safe to say that it is important that the highest quality work is undertaken on a contractual basis by all contractors. And where that is not the case, uh, contractors should be held to account. Question four, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the latest teacher number statistics and what steps it's taking to retain teachers at all levels of education. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, the school census data published last week demonstrates that the action the Scottish Government is taking on teacher recruitment is working. Teacher numbers have increased for the fourth year in a row, rising to 52,247 in 2019, which is an increase of 288 on the previous year. We now have a 10-year high in overall teacher numbers and a 39-year high in primary teacher numbers. 
To further improve recruitment, we are offering bursaries for career changers to undertake teacher education in STEM subjects. A new phase of our recruitment campaign is underway and we have added Napier and Queen Margaret Universities as teacher education providers. Angus MacDonald. Uh, thank you. I thank the Deputy First Minister for, for his reply and welcome the new numbers. I, I know he's acutely aware of the current Gaelic teacher shortage uh, and I welcome the action taken by the Scottish Government to date uh, to increase the numbers such as the Gaelic Immersion for Teachers or GIFT programme. Also, the bursaries offered through Board of Gaelic to help with course fees are welcome. However, has the Scottish Government given any consideration to raising the bursary level higher to match the STEM bursary, which would go a long way towards encouraging more teachers into GME? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Mr Macdonald is correct that Gaelic teacher education is a priority for the Scottish Government, and I discussed many of these issues at a, a gathering of Gaelic, Gaelic medium educators uh, just um, a couple of weeks, uh, just a couple of weeks ago in Edinburgh, um, where we were focusing on some of these challenges. Now, the question of the bursary level is a matter for Board and Gaelic. I think it's a welcome intervention that Board and Gaelic have made, um, and the board also offers a, a variety of other teaching support uh, to help individuals uh, participate. Now, of course, I'll raise with Board and Gaelic the suggestion that Mr. Macdonald has made today. Could I also say that one of the challenges that we need to address? is whether or not there are more teachers who are Gaelic speakers could be persuaded to strengthen their, 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 their capacity within the Gaelic language uh, to therefore be able to be part of the, uh, the Gaelic medium education system within Scotland. And that's one of the uh, themes that's being examined in the Faster Rate of Progress initiative on the Gaelic language that I commenced in August 2018, and which is um, uh, about ensuring that we deliver on the contents of the Gaelic National Plan formulated by Borden Gaelic and approved by Ministers. Question 6, Gil Patterson. Thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve teacher recruitment. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, we continue to support universities in the development of new and alternative routes into teaching, including a focus on increasing the number of STEM teachers. Mm -hmm. These routes into teaching have attracted around 800 people over the last two years who may not, who may not otherwise have entered teaching. We are offering bursaries of £20,000 for career changers to do teacher training in STEM subjects where the demand is at its greatest. A new phase of our Teaching Makes People recruitment campaign is underway and, as I indicated to Mr Macdonald, we have added Napier and Queen Margaret Universities as teacher education providers. Gil Patterson. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Uh, the latest statistics demonstrate the Scottish Government recruitment drive is certainly working. Uh, for comparison, and, uh, can the Cabinet Secretary tell the Parliament and inform the public at the same time how the ratio of teachers to pupils in Scotland compares with the ratio elsewhere in the United Kingdom? Cabinet Secretary. The officer, can, can I just add to what I said earlier on in relation to the new initial teacher education providers? I've uh, just yesterday visited uh, Napier University in Edinburgh and some weeks ago visited um, the new principal and vice-chancellor at Queen Margaret University, our former clerk, Paul Grice, uh, to see the new initial teacher education courses at Queen Margaret. And I want to pay tribute to both universities for taking the initiative to offer their services in this important endeavour where they are delivering very strong results. Uh, in relation to Mr Patterson's question, there are fewer pupils, pupils per teacher in Scotland than in any other country in the United Kingdom. Uh, while the data is not directly comparable, we can say that in primary schools there are 15.9 pupils per teacher in Scotland, compared to 20.9 in England, 22 in Wales and 22.3 in Northern Ireland. And in the secondary sector there are 12.4 pupils per teacher in Scotland, compared to 16.3 in England, 17 in Wales and 15.7 in Northern Ireland. Question 5, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what financial backing it will provide to North Eastern Council to support the construction of a new Ardrossan Academy. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I'm pleased that an Ardrossan Adros Community Learning and Innovation Hub to replace Ardrossan Academy and Winton Primary School is one of the projects to benefit from the first phase of the new £1 billion Learning Estate Investment Programme. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Uh, can you advise how much the SNP Government has invested in building new schools in North Ayrshire since 2007 and what has been delivered for that investment compared to the £400 million it's costing North Ayrshire's people over 30 years for the five PFI schools built by Labour prior to 2007? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, the 
Uh, Scottish Government supported uh, the, the construction of uh, Garnock Community Campus and the Largs uh, Campus. The, both of these uh, campuses, of course, are, um, uh, are 2 to 18 campuses, and we supported them with significant funding of over £44 million. Pounds. Now, that funding has enabled the creation of two um, world-class educational facilities in North Ayrshire. I know they will be well used by North Ayrshire Council, and they are, of course, offered as part of sustainable funding, unlike the expensive system of PFI, which is such a burden for local authorities across the country. Question 7, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether the performance of Scotland in maths and science that was recorded in the recent PISA results is its poorest. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the PISA results for 2018 show our performance in science and maths is in line with the OECD average and statistically similar to the Scotland results from the previous survey in 2015. The results are stable, but stable is not good enough. We are committed to the measures that we have to put in place to drive improvement in attainment across Scotland and in particular to close the poverty-related attainment gap. If you're brief, I manage to get your colleague, Mr Cameron, in. So uh, your supplementary, please. Then I shall be brief, presiding officer. I asked very specifically about the PISA results, which show that Scotland's performance in maths and science is at record lows, with maths falling from 17th to 31st since the SNP took office. It is an appalling indictment of this government's mismanagement and a shameful legacy to bequeath our children. Has the Cabinet Secretary any ideas how to arrest this slide? And when will the statistics start improving? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Mr Kerr could have possibly yeah. said that our reading score has improved significantly. But he chose not to, because what he did was he indulged in the perpetual, miserable, anti-education agenda of the Conservatives, which is all about talking down Scottish education. They tried it in the election last week, and they took a hammering. They were sent homeward to think again. Scottish education is improving, and the Conservatives are going downhill very, very fast. Question eight, Donald Cameron. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support pupil learning in the Highlands and Islands region. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the Scottish Government is undertaking a range of actions to support pupil learning in the Highlands and Islands. In 2019-20, schools in the four Highlands and Islands authorities together received a total of over £4 million in pupil equity funding. In the same year, Highland Council received over £0.9 million in Gaelic-specific grant to help them meet, meet the costs of Gaelic education. And Highland Council is also in receipt of £4 million in capital funding to support the building of the new Gaelic school in the Inverness area. And in 2018-19, around £750,000 of Scottish Government funding was used by the Northern Alliance Regional Improvement Collaborative to support educational improvement across the Alliance region, including in the Highlands and Islands. Donald Cameron, briefly, please. Thank you. Uh, new figures published by the Scottish Government show that in the Highland Council region, teachers reported that in primary seven, just 60% of pupils had reached the expected level for writing and 62% for numeracy. Does the Deputy First Minister accept these figures are totally unacceptable? And what will his government do specifically for primary seven children in the Highland Council region? Well, Cabinet Secretary. As a consequence of the extensive data that the Scottish Government has put in place, which totally contradicts Mr Burnett's silly question at the first, first question. Because of the data that we've put in place, we now are able to have the discussion that Mr Cameron has raised with me, where he is quite right that performance levels in Highland schools need to improve, which is why the government puts in place the financial support to the Northern Alliance to assist in building and improving educational performance so because of the data we've put in place, we know where the challenges are, we can support schools to improve performance, and that's exactly what the Scottish Government is going to do. Thank you. That concludes questions on those portfolios, and we'll briefly move on in a moment to health and sport when ministers are ready. Question one, State of Warwick. To ask the Scottish Government 
what the impact has been of the Scottish Ambulance Service's response times policy. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. The impact of the introduction of a new clinical response model within the Ambulance Service in November 2016 has been extremely positive. By focusing on responding as quickly as possible to the sickest of patients, the new model is saving more lives. Evaluation of the new model showed a 44% increase in 30-day survival rates for cardiac arrest patients in the first year. This equates to 1,182 people. In this year to date, of the 547 cardiac arrest calls the service has attended to where the patient has presented with a shockable rhythm, 54.8% uh, of these patients have been taken to hospital following SAS achieving a return of spontaneous circulation. Sarah Borick. Can I thank the Minister for his answer and say that I want to raise a particular issue in terms of what I believe is a mismatch between the Scottish Ambulance Service guidelines which put diabetic patients at low priority and the advice of Diabetes UK which states that any patient who becomes unconscious due to hypo needs an ambulance. And I would like to know whether the Scottish Government agrees with Diabetes UK on this. The context is that one of my constituents was unconscious and didn't just wait three and a half hours for an ambulance, he waited three and a half hours for the ambulance service to check whether he was still alive and needed support. Minister. Thank the member for um, her question. Obviously the, the specific issue that the member raises is one that she's written to the to government on and, and has received a response. And um, I think she'll be aware that there is now a formal investigation as to why that happened, because clearly the, that three hour plus wait to get that clinical callback is, is not acceptable. Um, it is appropriate that um, the ambulance service triages to make sure that the, 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 the people who are most in need of an ambulance um, get that fastest and that is working and that is saving lives. But clearly in order to, to have that uh, triage uh, working properly, then there needs to be those, those callbacks. So I'm aware that the particular case that the member is talking about is, is being investigated by the Scottish Ambulance Service. Briefly, Liam McCarthy. Uh, thank you very much. Very much. Um, can I ask the Minister how often in some time frame uh, emergency calls are waiting whilst Orkney's only land ambulance resource is already on a call and has there ever been a time where there's been no land ambulance cover? I, I think it's unfortunate. Orkney? We can't quite hear you clearly, Mr MacArthur. I'll get the recording Sorry, people um, put it up. You've got such a gentle voice. <laughs> I do my best. You repeat I it. I do my best. How often in some time frame are emergency calls waiting whilst Orkney's only land ambulance resource is already on a call? And has there ever been a time where there has been no land ambulance available um, on mainland Orkney over the last six months? Minister. Well, I, I thank the member for his question and for, uh, for repeating it. Um, that's, that's, I, th I think it's maybe something that we, we need to, to, I need to go and look at. Um, I, I'm actually speaking to the Scottish Ambulance Service tomorrow morning, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll raise the point that he's um, raised with them directly. Question two, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that since 2009, the number of GP practices in uh, Tayside has fallen from 69 to 63, while the average practice list size has increased. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. The reason for the reduction in GP practice numbers in Tayside is in part a result of practice mergers since 2009. Mergers can prevent practices, particularly small or single-handed ones, from closing by reducing risk and increasing resilience. Uh, since 2009, uh, in addition, uh, three practices have closed in Tayside. Bridge Verne, Ardler and Stobswell were all small independent practices. The government has put a number of specific measures in place to support GP practices, which I'm happy to ensure Mr uh, Fraser has detail of. Marta Fraser. Thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for that response. I've been contacted by constituents in Perth who have raised concerns about the times they're having to wait for a GP appointment, a situation which has been made uh, much worse recently following the closure of the GP practice in Bridge of Erne and the allocation without any consultation of hundreds of extra patients to the lists of city GP practices. What more can the Scottish Government do to assist with this situation? Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to Mr Fraser for that uh, additional question. Uh, of course, as he knows, uh, as I do, uh, that the Bridge of Erne uh, practice closure was, uh, I think, the, probably the best way to describe this, is not well handled. 
uh, and we have raised those matters directly with NHS Tayside to ensure that we don't see a repetition of that. Uh, we've also, uh, I think, been in contact with the GPs from that particular practice and have offered to hear from them about what additional uh, steps that they would find helpful uh, from, not from that practice, but also from the practice that the patients have been uh, reallocated to, if there are additional measures that they would find useful for us uh, to offer them to be able to uh, accommodate those uh, additional patients. Uh, the final point I'd make, though, is, as Mr Fraser knows, uh, uh, primary care and GP practices isn't just about GP numbers. It is about the whole multidisciplinary team. And I'm pleased to say that across NHS Tayside, including in Perth, we have seen uh, a significant increase in the level of multidisciplinary teams uh, using the skills, the professional skills of advanced nurse practitioners, of pharmacists and pharmacist assistants, and of physios. Uh, of course, there is more to do, but I'm happy to take any specific suggestions that he might have with respect to the practice he's referencing. Question three, Maurice Corrie. Government, what action it is taking in response to reports of worsening delays in the waiting times for children and young children and young people to receive mental health treatment? Minister Claire Hockey. I have been absolutely clear that long waits for children and young people to access mental health treatment are unacceptable. There is no simple solution in the face of increased demand for children and young people's mental health services. And that's why we're undertaking an ambitious programme of work to monitor and drive performance in mental health waiting times across Scotland, while also supporting early intervention in community settings and across the third sector, local government and the NHS. And this includes £250 million to support positive mental health for children and young people, in addition to £58 million over four years, specifically to improve access to CAMS and psychological therapies and to invest in additional staff. And through the Children and Young People's Mental Health and Wellbeing Programme Board, jointly chaired with COSLA, we're implementing the key recommendations from the COYA Task Force, the Youth Commission on Mental Health and the SAMH Audit of Rejected Referrals. Maurice Corrie. Thank you, Deputy uh, Officer. I thank the uh, Minister for her answer and I understand what she's saying. But nevertheless, local delivery plan standards state that 90% of young people are to start treatment for these services within 18 weeks of referral. However, the most recent release shows that only 64.5% met this standard in the last quarter. Will the uh, Minister explain why this mental health crisis has not improved despite a commitment to improve early interventions? Minister. Well, as I said in my previous answer, we're working very closely with um, CAMS and, and others to ensure that we do improve um, the overall performance of uh, CAMS waiting time standards. We've committed to publishing a new CAMS specification, which lays out the standards that children and young people and their families can expect. And this work has also been informed by the SAMH Audit of Rejected Referrals. And the 2019-2020 programme for government, we set out our plans to work with NHS boards to deliver, tra deliver trajectories to meet the mental health waiting time standards by December 2020. And these trajectories will be set out in boards' annual operating plans, ensuring that performance is tied to funding. Mary Fee, briefly. Looked after children are a group for whom CAM support can be vital. When children move placements and, and into new areas, they can drop off already long waiting lists and end up at the back of the queue. What assessment has the government done on this situation and what action are they taking to ensure all looked after children can access appropriate mental health support when they need it? Minister. I thank Mary Fee for, for raising that issue. And uh, if she remembers that part of the COYA task force, one of the strands of that work was to look after uh, vulnerable children or to highlight children who were at risk, both those who are looked after and accommodated, but also those who are um, in the youth justice system and going through uh, children's panel hearings. So certainly the uh, mental health, children and uh, young people's mental health and wellbeing delivery board will be looking at the specific recommendations made by the COYA task force to ensure that that particularly vulnerable group do not fall through gaps. Question four, Bob Doris. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it plans to extend access to palliative care services for homeless people. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. Our strategic framework, framework for action on palliative and end-of-life care makes clear that we want everyone 
who would benefit from palliative care to have access to it, including, including those who are homeless. To achieve this vision, it's essential that health and social care professionals have early planning consideration with those nearing the end of their life to ensure that people get the care and support that is right for them. With this in mind, we've focused our efforts on supporting frontline health and social care services to engage more frequently and meaningfully with homeless individuals so that they can access care and support services as quickly as possible. Bob Doris. I thank the Minister for that answer. I chair the cross-party group in this Parliament on palliative care. Our CPG have suggested improvements, including palliative care nurse specialists working with homeless services and palliative care beds specifically for homeless individuals and a range of other measures. Will the Minister carefully consider the range of innovative suggestions that we have made to improve service to this highly excluded group? Minister. Thank uh, Bob Doris for his question and for the cross-party group for their work and, and efforts and, and their, their suggestions are a useful contribution um, to the discussion and I will um, make sure that, that they are passed on to the Homelessness Prevention and Strategy Group which is co-chaired by the Minister for Local Government and COSLA. That oversees the implementation of the Ending Homelessness Together Action Plan and includes a public health representative. At their last meeting on the 10th of December, um, they had a discussion about the next steps that could be taken to improve joint working between health and, and homelessness services. So I think that's an appropriate um, uh, area to make sure we're getting that joined up working to look at the, the, the very important issues that the member and the cross-party group have raised. Monica Lennon, briefly. Sadly, a rising number of homeless people are discharged from hospital with no home to go to. The Scottish Government has said previously it has no plans to update research or collate data on the use of health services by homeless people. Is this something the Scottish Government will look at again? Minister. I think that the data that the member is referring to um, was collated in 2018. So I think what, what we need to do is to, um, again, partly looking at the, um, the working group that I talked about, the HPSG, look at how we can use that data to ensure that we, we, we do make sure people get the support that they need when they need. Clearly, one of the, 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 the first areas around that is making sure that um, when we're dealing with uh, people in this situation that their, their housing um, needs are met and that's why the, the housing first model is I think really really important understanding that that people have complex needs but if you've got a complex health need and you don't have some place to stay then clearly it's really difficult for us to so I, I think the housing model is 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 really positive and provides us with an opportunity clearly it's early days in terms of how that is implemented and rolled out and i know there's a, a number of different um, models across the country about housing first is, is being implemented but feedback so far that i've anecdotally heard is generally positive question five edward mount thank you presiding officer to ask the scottish government what action it is taking to assist nhs highland to reduce its reliance on locum staff cabinet secretary uh, the number of medical and dental staff in NHS Highland uh, has in fact increased by 55.2% uh, between uh, 2006 and 2019. Um, however, NHS Highland continues to focus on reducing both the cost of locums and their reliance on them. Uh, ongoing actions taken by the board include a weekly control meeting, ongoing cost improvement programme, continuing work to recruit the cohort of clinical fellow posts, continuing work to recruit to permanent posts, including offering flexible working and alternative roles to encourage uh, doctors in particular to work in NHS Highland. And they have also been engaged uh, with a medical recruitment agency focusing on international recruitment to vacant posts across NHS Highland in some way emulating the success of NHS Grampian in that regard. They're also working with the NHS Scottish Global Citizenship Programme, which offers new opportunities to doctors to work as remote and rural consultants in rural general hospitals while being able to participate in global citizenship in both Scotland and abroad. Edward Mount. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for their answer. And now we know that the construction of the new elective care centre will be delayed until early next year. And latest figures show that NHS Highland are spending over £20 million a year on bank relief and agency staff payrolls. Is the Cabinet Secretary sure she will be able to fully staff the elective care centre when it is finally finished without increasing these costs? Cabinet Secretary. 
so in the overall NHS Highland uh, spend, uh, it is worth noting that in terms of agency use of nursing and midwifery uh, agency staff, that figure uh, has decreased. So whilst overall Mr Mountain is correct, I do think uh, facts are important. In terms of where uh, NHS Highland uh, is concerned, I'm sure he'll be pleased to know that in the last quarter, the vacancy rate in NHS Highland decreased to 11.7%, whilst the number of longer-term consultant vacancies of six months or more also decreased by 7.4%. So there's a, a range of work going on in terms of uh, recruitment in these areas. Perhaps one of the most interesting is the work that we're undertaking with the Royal College of Surgeons uh, and the North region, so that includes NHS Highland, NHS Grampian and NHS Tayside, to create the Scottish Clinical Collaborative, which will see uh, consultants, uh, very experienced consultants towards the end of their career, uh, taking time uh, to work in remote and rural areas, which will have be, of course, of great assistance to NHS Highland. Part of our workforce planning includes uh, building into uh, what we need in terms of the elective centres, as well as uh, a number of uh, other parts of our service. And I'm sure uh, Mr Mountain will have been pleased to see the publication of the integrated workforce plan on Monday of this week. Question six, not Lords. Question seven, Peter Chapman. The Scottish Government, what measures it plans to take in response to statistics showing that 65.4% of patients referred to NHS Grampian were treated within 18 weeks? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, as part of the Scottish Government's Waiting Times Improvement Plan, we are making available more than £108 million to health boards in this financial year uh, this, to increase capacity in the system. For example, more staffing, evening and weekend clinics, additional theatre sessions, all of which ensure progress towards delivering on that plan's trajectories. This does include over £11 million provided to NHS Grampian, where recent improvements using those additional funds have been put in place, including increasing capacity at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, recruitment of additional staff, utilising additional capacity at Strathcaro Regional Treatment Centre and at the Golden Jubilee Hospital in particular for orthopaedic patients. Peter Chapman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but sadly when it comes to NHS Grampian, long waiting times is a familiar story and in the North East we fall far below the national average. And on the back of this news, an NHS Grampian spokesperson stated that if a patient's condition worsens, they should contact their GP. However, recent GP figures show that Grampian has lost 13 GP surgeries in the last 10 years with longer waiting times and a decreasing number of GP surgeries. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain how patients are able to get the vital treatment that they need. Cabinet Secretary. So treatment for elective work primarily, but also the initiation in many cases of uh, the cancer waiting times. And I think it is just fair to point out that in terms of NHS Grampian, they have for the second quarter met the 31-day uh, uh, cancer wait time target and are seeing an improvement in terms of the 62-day target. Uh, but in terms, uh, for most patients, the trigger uh, for those referrals is their GP surgery, so I can understand in some way why that uh, piece of advice was uh, from Mr uh, Chapman given to a particular patient. However, uh, I expect boards to be in constant touch with patients who are on their waiting list, keeping them updated as to uh, when they should expect uh, their appointment to be met. Uh, and explaining to them uh, why uh, there are delays if there are delays. If there are particular instances for Mr Chapman where that has not happened, then I'd be very happy to hear about those so I can deal with those directly with NHS Grampian as I have done with other boards. Question 8, Willie Coffey. You to ask the Scottish Government how many people in East Ayrshire receive free personal nursing care, what the qualifying age groups are to receive this and what the annual cost is. Cabinet Secretary. So the latest figures available show that in free personal and nursing care uh, from uh, the Scottish statistics, the number of people in receipt of free personal and nursing care in 1718, that's the latest figures in East Ayrshire, was 1,680 at a cost of £13.3 million. As Mr Coffey will know, as of April this year, uh, personal care is free for all eligible adults. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and the very positive impact this service unique to Scotland is having on the most vulnerable people in my constituency. 
Are there any plans to formally evaluate the impact and outcomes of the policy so that we might be able to consider further improvements in this important area of care in the years to come? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, it's an interesting question from Mr Coffey. I'm very grateful to him for it. Uh, there are no uh, specific plans for that evaluation, although I'm very happy to give some further thought to uh, how we might do that and whether uh, that would produce valuable information to us. Uh, he will be aware, though, of course, that we are undertaking a programme of work. Uh, we've undertaken it this year. We will uh, conclude it in the coming year. Uh, it's in programme for government on the reform of adult social care. I've recently had a very useful meeting with Alzheimer's Scotland to look at what more we might do in terms of personal care and health care uh, for those individuals suffering from uh, dementia. Uh, all of that uh, will allow us to look at what more we might do in these areas uh, within uh, and balance all of that. Of course, we may have to do much of it in a phased way, depending on the overall cost. But I'm very open to, and the work is underway, uh, about what more we might do in terms of providing uh, the personal care as well as the health care support for adults who require that from us in order that we can ensure that they can live as independently with respect and as close to home as possible. Thank you. That concludes questions in health and sport. We'll move shortly on to questions in communities and local government. And while we're doing that, can I say the third portfolio, I remind members that questions two and four are grouped together. However, the member, Jamie Green, whose Lord's question two is not here, uh, he better have a good explanation. Uh, so we'll be moving from one straight on to four and then on to three, because I know members are sort of expecting that. Question one, Claire Baker. Scott, to ask the Scottish Government what funding streams and other support are available for alternative mechanisms to the Business Improvement District model. Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. Bids are a means to help empower local businesses to raise their own funds to deliver their locally agreed plans and there are no set funding streams for alternative mechanisms. The Scottish Government funds Scotland's Town Partnership to provide support to organisations and groups that have an interest in establishing bids or other approaches to improving their town centres and neighbourhoods. Claire Baker. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware of the challenges being faced in five towns this year. While this week businesses in Cooper have supported the Digital Improvement District, in Dunfermline the bid Dunfermline delivers lost their recent ballot and they're re-emerging as a public interest company which has some funding from five councils as a transitional measure, but they are seeking alternative funding. And this year also Kirkcaldy for All decided not to go for a third ballot and they're trying to reinvent themselves as a digital innovation district. As the Minister, sorry, as the Cabinet Secretary can see, the model is fragile. And can I ask what consideration has been given to how the changing nature of the High Street and the pressure on our businesses is impacting on the ability of bids to be successful? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I, I welcome the news that Cooper have uh, approved their digital improvement district, the first uh, in Scotland, uh, which is to be welcomed. And of course, we are disappointed that uh, Dunfermline Delivers was unsuccessful uh, in going uh, forward for uh, that re-ballot. Uh, I understand, as Claire Baker said, that the Council is looking at options to build on the work of Dunfermline Delivers and has agreed to provide that transition fund that she describes uh, to help them possibly repurpose and develop a new bid. And I know certainly I met with the constituency member Shirley Ann Somerville regarding this and I know she has been helping uh, this group. So of course we do want to make sure that we keep uh, bids on, uh, under review to make sure that they're delivering for the town centres that they are there for. There is lots of success across the country. And that's why, again, you know, Scotland's Town Partnership is wanting to seek to develop a, a new and more expansive model for bids, ones that delivers for more inclusive and energetic partnerships, improves resources and impact, and ultimately brings greater sustainable growth to all areas all over Scotland. And SP, uh, T, uh, STP sorry, are looking to uh, ensure that they can support bids in a more fulsome way so that they can uh, maybe try and avoid some of the disappointment that I know has been expressed in Dunfermline to help empower our communities to take more control and charge over their town centres. So happy again to engage with the member. Uh, I know that uh, Shirley Ann Somerville has been making good representations on behalf of Dunfermline Fairland delivers, but you know, Fife has also benefited from a number of other funding streams, such as the uh, RG, RCGF fund since 2013 as well, to support town centres across the region. Question four, Tom Arthur. Officer, um, to ask the Scottish Government how it supports communities in tackling inequality. Cabinet Secretary. 
2017, we invested over £1.4 billion on support directives at low-income families. This includes key investment to deliver more affordable homes, tackle fuel poverty, support our attainment Scotland fund, and over £100 million to mitigate the worst impacts of UK government welfare cuts. Our new £11.5 million investing in communities fund will provide vital support and investment to our down 250 organisations to enable them to tackle poverty, inequality and rural disadvantage across our communities. And our Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan outlines our concrete action to reduce child poverty. And this includes plans for our new Scottish child payment worth uh, £10 per child per week that will be paid to eligible families with a child under six by Christmas uh, next year. Tom Arthur. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? Auchenbach Active, based at the Auchenbach Resource Centre in Barhead in my constituency of Renfisher South, do a power of work to tackle inequality in their community, including distributing Christmas presents so that children from across the area will receive a gift over the festive period. Will the Cabinet Secretary join me in thanking Auchenbach Active for all the work they do all year round, and will she accept my invitation to visit the Auchenbach Resource Centre next year to see their brilliant work firsthand? Yeah, Secretary. Absolutely. I pay a tribute like uh, uh, Tom Arthur has uh, to the work and effort and endeavour that Auchenbach Active are clearly doing across their community. For some of that effort, I wish they didn't have to do it if only uh, there wasn't the severe welfare cuts that had been imposed in too many of our communities. Work like that wouldn't be necessary. However, it is to uh, the testimony and pay tribute to Auchenbach for not uh, sitting back and letting that happen and ensuring that children in that area are, are getting the support they deserve and the work of community-led organisations like Auchenbach Active is truly inspiring, delivering tangible positive outcomes for people locally uh, and I uh, would be happy to commend the good work that they are doing and happy to also uh, visit the organisation uh, next year if Tom Arthur would get in touch with my office I'm sure we'll be able to fix up a date soon. Thank you. Question three, Fulton McGregor. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to encourage more house building in heavily populated urban towns and areas such as in Coatbridge. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Scottish planning policy is clear that development plans should guide most new urban development to take place within existing settlements or in planned extensions. And we're now preparing Scotland's fourth national planning framework, which will set out where development is needed to support sustainable and inclusive growth areas in Scotland. Fulton McGregor. And can I thank the Minister for that response? He will be aware that in Coatbridge, which makes up the largest part of my constituency, new housing is very much welcome to regenerate the area and improve li living standards. Whereas in the northern part of my constituency, such as in Steps and Gartcosh, new developments are often more controversial because they are proposed often to be on Greenbelt. I would just uh, take this uh, brief opportunity presiding officer, to again pay tribute to the work of the Safe Steps Green Belt Group, for example, who I have written to the Minister about previously. Can I ask the Minister, therefore, what the Scottish Government is doing to encourage house building on derelict and brownfield sites in urban areas over greenfield land? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, Scottish planning policy uh, quite clearly states that the reuse or redevelopment of brownfield land uh, should be considered before new development takes place on greenfield sites. Uh, the efficient use of our finite resource uh, will also uh, be considered in the review of the national planning framework, uh, which is a, we're about to embark on. Question five, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government how its planning policy and guidance to local authorities on takeaway food outlets takes account of its policies on healthy eating. Minister. Uh, President Officer, the 2018 research report on the relationship between uh, the food environment and the planning system notes the lack of interaction between Scottish planning policy and diet. And we have committed uh, to exploring this further as we prepare the fourth national planning framework. Uh, and, wel and we would welcome uh, discussion of these issues as, as part of the engagement programme for MPF4. Colin Beattie. I thank the Minister for his response. In my constituency of Midlothian North and Musselburgh, there have been several instances where a multiplicity of new takeaway food outlets have been rejected by both the local community and the council, but which were approved by the government reporter on appeal. Are stronger guidelines favouring healthy eating likely to be developed? Minister. Um, President officer, I agree completely and utterly. Uh, 
uh, that planning policy uh, should do all that it can to support health and well-being in all of our communities across, the Scotland, uh, across Scotland. Uh, and as I said in my previous answer, I would welcome views uh, from uh, within the chamber and beyond uh, on how this can be uh, achieved. Um, we will begin early engagement on MPF4 uh, from January of next year. Um, I, I should say that in the meantime, uh, reporters are required to make their decision in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise, having fully consider, considered all of the evidence uh, before them, including representations uh, from members of the public. Uh, I would welcome uh, any, uh, any uh, submission that Mr. Uh, uh, Beattie wants to put forward uh, in terms of getting this right for MPF4, as I would every other member. Thank you. Brian Whittle, briefly, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Officer. I wonder if, uh, what the Minister's response would be uh, to a council in England who have managed to implement an exclusion, an exclusion zone around schools for food vans and whether the Scottish Government would, would again consider this uh, as a way forward to health eating planning. Minister. Uh, President Officer, as I said, I would welcome uh, any submission from any member uh, on this and if they want to provide evidence of what has happened elsewhere, uh, I'm more than willing to look at that. National Planning Framework 4 uh, will be, uh, of course, uh, a situation where we uh, go out and consult with as many stakeholders as possible on a variety of issues. I know that many uh, have an interest in terms of uh, healthy eating uh, and the part that planning can play uh, in all of that. Uh, and uh, as I said to uh, Mr. Beattie, uh, I would welcome any submission uh, from Mr. Whittle on this subject. Question six, not Lords. Question seven, Mike Rumbles. To ask the Scottish Government further to its answer to question S5003821, what plans it has to require privately owned flats and tower blocks over 11 metres high to have fire safety certification? Minister. Uh, President officer, there are no plans to introduce the uh, fire safety certification of the type that Mr. Rumbles describes. Provisions to address fire safety in buildings are required under building regulations at the point building work is carried out. This applies to all dwellings, uh, regardless of tenure or building height. Uh, the member may be interested to also know that we have produced fire safety information leaflets containing advice for residents in high rises on how to prevent fires in the home and what to do if one starts in their building. Uh, and these are being delivered to all homes and high-rise buildings and will also be available in libraries and community centres. Mike Rumbles. <clears throat> Whilst we know that building regulations are not retrospective, in fact, the Minister said that to me last time, Scottish Ministers have the power to direct local authorities to require existing buildings to conform to current building standards under Section 25 of the Building Scotland's Act 2003. Why is the Minister so reluctant to use it? Minister. Uh, this is a very complex uh, area and uh, I often get uh, castigated in this chamber uh, for using uh, ministerial direction, which I do very rarely indeed. If Mr. Rumbles uh, <laughs> wants to sit down with me and building standards officials to discuss this in some depth, I am more than happy to do so. Uh, one of the things which I should make quite clear, uh, President Officer, is that the Scottish Government is not complacent. Uh, about uh, building standards and that is why we put in place uh, the expert panels to advise us on building standards and on fire safety uh, and we will continue uh, to engage uh, on all of these issues in order that we get things right but I do think uh, that members would be uh, very very upset uh, if I started using ministerial direction but I am more than happy to talk to Mr Rumbles further on this issue. Sarah Boric. I'm very interested in the Minister's comments there. I think it's appropriate we get this right. Um, but in the meantime, what advice would the Minister give to my constituents who are still experiencing problems and have concerns about the valuation of their properties when they attempt to sell the flats and put them on the market? Um, Minister. President Officer, I share uh, Ms Boyack's concerns. Uh, and my heart goes out to those folks who are finding difficulty at this moment in time in selling properties uh, and moving on. 
Uh, and that is why um, I met with officials again, our officials again this morning, uh, to try and ensure uh, that we can move um, UK finance, but more importantly, uh, the UK government further forward um, on uh, this particular issue. Um, as members are aware, uh, I've written to uh, uh, Robert Jenrick, the UK Secretary of State, twice in this, uh, on this issue, uh, with a reminder later as well. And I hope that uh, now that uh, the UK Parliament is back, uh, that Mr Jenrick uh, will furnish us with a response uh, so that we can do what is necessary to ensure that Miss Boyack's constituents and many others across the country uh, can get out of the difficulties um, that they are currently in. Uh, but the Chamber can be assured uh, that I will continue to do all that I can uh, to move this issue forward. Question 8, John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the planning decision on the proposed development of a golf course at Cool Links will be announced. Minister. Uh, President officer, we are giving full consideration to the reporter's report and recommendation which we received on the 27th of November and a decision will be issued as soon as possible. John Finney. Thank you, President officer. I, I thank the Minister for that response. Given the proposed development could potentially affect a European protected site and the decision could be made after the UK has exited the European Union, can the Minister advise what environmental government arrange arrangements, governance arrangements, I do beg your pardon, will be in place to provide oversight of decisions like this one and ensure environmental standards will be upheld. Minister. Uh, President officer, I have to be very careful in what I say. As Mr Finney well knows, uh, this is still a live uh, planning application. But let me say that uh, in general, uh, Ramsar sites have been protected um, through the co-designation uh, with other regimes uh, since uh, Ramsar sites were first designated um, in Scotland. Uh, Scottish Government policy on Ramsar sites uh, was established in the year 2000 uh, and it is Scottish Government policy that Ramsar sites be treated in the same manner as Natura sites, uh, Natura sites being special areas of conser conservation and special protection areas, which are designated under the European Habitats and Birds Directive. Uh, whilst variations in the expression of the policy over the years uh, necessitated the publication of guidance earlier this year, uh, this policy has not changed. Thank you, that concludes portfolio questions and we'll shortly move on to the next item of business.